I'm usually at the Glenelg gathering, uh, so as I look around, uh, there's a lot of faces I don't recognise, and maybe you don't recognise me. Uh, so I'm Jonathan, uh, myself and my wife, Shannon. Uh, we've been coming along to City Light for about a year and a half now. Uh, how did we end up here? Uh, about two years ago, we were approaching marriage and looking for a house to move into, uh, a rental, and we were kind of hoping and praying uh, that we'd get anywhere south of the city. Uh, I come from Aldinga. Shannon from Strathalban, and so a lot of our family and friends are all that way. And uh, a spot popped up in Glengarry. We hadn't even heard of the suburb Glengarry before we moved in. Uh, we said yes to it, and uh, through one person I knew here at City Light, uh, Matthew Greer, uh, here we are. I say I knew one person. Uh, I knew there was a loose uh, connection with Beck. Uh, but in my first conversation with Beck, like what she led with uh, was she told me that she used to babysit me. Uh, So, you think that Adelaide is small, Uh, can you imagine me, I think I know this person maybe a little bit, and then I find out maybe she's changed my nappy. Um, The walls start to close in. So, anyway, uh, as a church, we've been going through the book of Titus, uh, the letter to Titus, rather, uh, written by Paul, uh, who was Saul, who used to persecute and kill Christians, amazing story of his conversion, and became uh, one of the most significant people in, uh, definitely in Christian history, but post-Jesus, you know, one of the most significant people in history. And it's a real privilege uh, for me to be able to share with you this morning. Uh, In a lot of ways, I feel like the pressure is off. Um, I feel no pressure uh, for you to walk away from this morning saying something like, uh, wow, no one ever spoke like Jonathan spoke this morning. Um, In fact, like one of my measures for success would be that you go away from this morning and you open your Bibles again and you say, "Uh, wow, I'd never seen that before. That'd be a real measure for success for me. So in in one sense, I feel like there's the pressure's off for me. Uh, But at the same time, I really feel the responsibility to uh, accurately uh, show you what's in here. Um, So I need help. Uh, You need help. Let's pray before I say too much more. Oh, Father, we just think you are awesome. Um, We just thank you so much that we can gather here. I just pray in a very real and tangible way. I ask you, Father, that you would fill this room with your Holy Spirit. Uh, I don't pray that in a weird and abstract way. Um, I I pray that in a very real way, Lord, that you would uh, come into this room and in our heads uh, give us clarity, make this truth sit there and and find a place in our our minds. Uh, But ultimately, Lord... Not that we would just walk away smarter and uh, better versed in your gospel, in your words, uh, but that we would actually love it. Pray that you would bring about a love for you uh, through this time. I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to take you back to the year 1597. Uh, Marty, we're going back. Um, We're going back to Japan. So this is a time of great hostility to Christianity over 400 years ago. Um, And where we're picking up the story is of... 26 Christians. Now, some of these people had moved over as missionaries to Japan. Uh, Some had become converts from within Japan. And all 26 of them uh, were ordered to a death, now in quotation marks, uh, like that of the God they proclaimed. 26 Christians put on their own individual crosses uh, to die. And where we're picking up the story is of what's recounted for us, what's told by them, of what they said and did when they were on the cross. Uh, It goes like this. Uh, Anthony of Nagasaki had come home to be martyred. His parents were in the front row of the crowd, not far from him. Uh, When his mother began weeping, he called out to comfort her. And then he joined a chorus that the others had started, not wanting his particular part to be left out. He was 13 years old. Martin of Ascension broke out into praise, crying out, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. The younger ones among them, five or under the age of 20, uh, broke into a psalm learned in catechism. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. This is what they were saying when they were on the cross, in case that wasn't clear. Uh, John of Goto, a 19-year-old, had just taken his vows as a priest that morning. Uh, When one of the priests in the crowd came to comfort him, 
telling him that heaven was near, he responded gladly with a smile. Don't worry, Father, I'm quite aware of that. Uh, Next to John was Louis Ibaki. At hearing the mention of heaven, he pressed against the ropes as if wanting to jump into his Saviour's arms. He sang in his soprano voice, Paradise, Paradise, Jesus, Mary. He was only 12 years old. You know, when I was 12 years old, (laughs) when I was 12 years old, (laughs) um, I was asked to give a devotion at youth group and I was, I was very nervous about giving this devotion. Uh, I'd never done something like that before. It's one of those moments where they're privileging the voice of the youth and saying, what are you learning? And uh, I shared that story uh, from that book uh, at youth group. And uh, really, I think underneath, like, I, I found that story awesome. Um, when you're a 12, 13-year-old, you don't have people that you look up to, uh, you have heroes, Okay. Warren Treadray was right up there for me. Uh, and underneath them at the time uh, was that story of those people. And uh, I think underneath my awe was a question. I didn't articulate it at the time, uh, but a question which is, what is the secret to living a godly life? I made a slideshow. I'm really thankful for Don and for Elijah for getting it working this morning. If you're a note taker, I encourage you to write this one down. Um, Because as I read the text in Titus, that's the question that really jumped out at me. What is the secret to living a godly life? Or in layman's terms, uh, how were they able to sing when they were dying on crosses? Um, So that's our question. I want to give you a bit of insight into my week before I answer it. Uh, I felt like at times I was being transported uh, back to my grandparents' house, my grandma and pops, where I first discovered the babushka doll. Okay, the Russian doll, uh, you know those little wooden dolls, you lift off the top, another one pops out, lift off the top, another one pops out, eventually you got eight, uh, all decreasing in size. I felt like as I lifted the lid of this scripture, uh, lots of huge Christian concepts popped out, uh, such as it kind of did my head in at different points. Um, so it's been a struggle to keep this message contained, uh, to keep it all focused on Jesus. Um, it looks quite neat on the surface, we're going to read it in a moment. Um, but I do have an answer. I've tried to contain it, and uh, we'll see how we go. So we're going to work backwards this morning. Uh, Rather than me giving you lots of words and then an answer at the end, uh, I'm going to give you my answer now, uh, such that if you had to leave, you would have a nice summary now. (laughs) And uh, that's not an invitation to leave. And uh, and then unpack it with the rest of our time. So uh, question, what is the secret to living a godly life? My answer is, uh, by God's Spirit being stunned by the grace of God for us in Jesus. What is the secret to living a godly life? Answer, it is by God's Spirit, being stunned by the grace of God for us in Jesus. Now, you shouldn't give a rip how I answer it. You should care how God answers it. Okay, And I really want you to see it. I hope you brought your Bibles. If you didn't, I give you permission, grab your phones, uh, look up the text for this morning. Uh, We're going to be in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. Um, Before we read it, I'm going to invite you to do two weird things. Now, don't be too scared. I have a Baptist background. Uh, You're all pretty safe, okay? So, number one, uh, I'm going to invite you to stand as we read God's Word. Now, don't do it yet. I want to just uh, explain why. Um, Standing is symbolic. Uh, It's a way of us saying that There's something happening inside and we want to show it outside. Um, It's also a way of us saying that we're ready for God's word to move us. We're not lounging around as we hear God's word spoken, but we're standing on our feet ready to be moved by it. Um, A friend of mine, it's it's another way of saying it's worthy of our respect. A friend of mine almost lives and dies by the saying that you never shake a man's hand sitting down. And that is his way of saying that whether I've met you before or I, I know you really well, I'm going to show you a certain level of respect as a person. I'm going to meet you eye to eye. Um, So that's one thing. The second thing is, after reading this text, I'm going to say this is God's word. Uh, This is God's word. And I invite you to respond with, uh, we agree. Okay? Uh, Why? Uh, Because this is God's word, first of all. And sometimes we don't agree with it. Uh, But God's word triumphs over our feelings. Uh, And I really believe this, that the church either rises or falls uh, on its success or failure to agree with this, to 
to agree with this. So, not going to make you do these things. There's nothing special about them in and of themselves beside giving us a certain posture and readiness to actually receive from God. So, if you're keen, if you're able, if you're willing, I invite you to stand. And we're going to read uh, from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. And a reminder at the end, I'll say this is God's word. And I invite you to respond with, we agree. Here we go. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. This is God's word. Thank you. You can take a seat. Brilliant. Uh, So I've given you my answer, which is that by God's spirit is being stunned by the grace of God for us in Jesus. That's the secret to living a godly life. And as I read this text, uh, God's grace does three things, uh, at least three, but I see three. Uh, And if you're a note taker, they're going to be our structure uh, for this morning. Again, I've got a PowerPoint um, just so you don't miss those points. Uh, Point number one, God's grace has appeared. Point number one, God's grace has appeared. Now, there's no points for guessing where I get that from. Uh, Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared. Okay, so we're going to take those words one by one. And just chew on them for a bit and just sit in them. Okay? First of all, it starts with the word for. Uh, now, every time you see therefore or for in the Bible, uh, you ought to ask yourself, why is it therefore? And the answer is almost every time that it represents a link to the text, like what was said just before it. I've written my own little example just to kind of try and make sense of this for, uh, one that's true of me next week. Uh, So next week, here's my statement, I'm driving to Wagga Wagga uh, for my sister lives there. Okay? Uh, Now what am I doing there? I'm making a case. Uh, The first part is what I'm doing. I'm driving to Wagga Wagga. Uh, The second part's why I'm doing it. My sister lives there. And that for in the middle is saying that they both need to be understood together. I'm not just driving for no reason. I'm not just magically seeing my sister. The for says... They need to be understood together. Okay. So the question we should ask when we have this passage today is, what happened before it? And if you were here last week and the weeks before, you know exactly what came before it. Uh, Paul has been making claim after claim on our character, how we should act as Christians. He gave expectations for elders in the church, uh, older men, uh, the older women. He also gave uh, expectations on the younger women, and the younger men, kind of cuts across everybody at this point, and also bond servants like workers. Um, and if you're like me, uh, particularly for last week's sermon, uh, you thought, man, this sounds hard. This sounds really hard. Or if you like the question for this morning, what's the secret? How can I do this? And Paul's argument in a nutshell is we should be of godly character, that's what we do, for there's a reason... God's grace has appeared. God's grace has appeared. That one word is so important to our faith, so central, so core to who we are as Christians, uh, that God's grace has already shown up. We're not waiting for God's grace. God's grace has appeared. You know, this is something we need to do regularly, uh, which is bury the idea that we can do enough good works uh, for for God to kind of appear to us. Or come to us. God has already come. God has already come. God's grace is the foundation. Um, At a previous workplace I was at, there's a guy I got along with really well. Uh, He was an extreme sceptic of Christianity. Um, He was brilliant. Like he knew so much. I'm not just saying that. He he knew a lot more than I do, which isn't saying a whole lot. But but someone you respect for their research, uh, not so much for their conclusions, but someone I really respected for how much time he'd put into his thoughts. And we used to have these big chats. Uh, and he said to me one day, he turned to me, he said, you know, Jono, uh, I would believe in your God 
if he came one day, big, massive, glorious, uh, in the sky, and he pointed down at me and he said, Aaron, here I am. Do you know what my response was to Aaron? I said he did. His name is Jesus. Now, this is the miracle of the incarnation uh, in that we believe God stepped into humanity and became a person. You know, I think Aaron's response was something like, yeah, I just don't believe him. Um, and Aaron expected God to come in a different way. And truthfully, so did many people. And that's why they killed Jesus. Um, so how did he come? He came in grace, we're told in verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared. You know, that one word, grace, uh, summarises the whole ministry of Jesus. Could have chosen a lot of words, chose grace. What is this grace? How can it be understood? Uh, we're given a hint in that it brings something. We're told in verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. You know, this is the greatest news in the whole world. And uh, I think if we went out on the street and did a bit of a poll, uh, most people would shrug their shoulders and say, what of it? Uh, and therein lies the problem in that we don't really see a need for it the average Australian. It's worth asking yourself as well, to what extent have I become dulled to the message, to the good news of salvation? I think if you press the average Australian, um, I think they would say I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I've got no major issues. When I turn on the news each night, there's five different people who have done horrible things. I'm nothing like them. I'm not like my ex. I'm not like my neighbour. I'm doing pretty well. What's interesting is that Jesus was confronted with uh, people who were the exact same, uh, people who felt they were doing pretty well. And what does Jesus do about this? What does Jesus do about this? So we'll go to point two. I um, want to help you out a bit with this. Part A, um, Jesus comes with a severe warning, a really severe warning, and part B, a surprising welcome. We're going to start with the severe warning. Uh, back in 2016, I was determined to memorise the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7, good summary of the teaching of Jesus. Uh, and at first, I found the teachings of Jesus, like for a few years, uh, quite attractive, uh, quite interesting. Well, this is a good sermon. Um, as the years have gone on, I've realised it's a horrible sermon. Um, a, a more appropriate response, I think, would be to say, uh, God, save me from the Sermon on the Mount. There are some really scary teachings in there if you take it for face value. I think what I did and what we tend to do as Christians sometimes uh, is we, meet, we, we read Jesus through a lens that he came to save us uh, and, we, and the warnings that he gives uh, don't have the intended effect. They don't land how they're supposed to. I want to just step into the Sermon on the Mount very briefly. Um, essentially what Jesus does is he holds up the Ten Commandments and he makes them at least ten times harder. At least. Okay, I'm going to go through just two of them. Uh, Jesus holds up the commandment of uh, you shouldn't murder someone. Okay? Uh, most people in his day would have felt they were doing pretty well in that commandment. I dare say most of you would say you're doing pretty well in that commandment too. Jesus points to that commandment and says, uh, you see, that commandment about murder is actually pointing to the heart's issue of anger. Have you harboured anger before? The words of Jesus are that you are liable to the hell of fire. Now, some of us are kind of squirming in our seats when you hear that, but they are the words of Jesus. That's what he said. Um, he holds up the commandment of adultery. Most people in Jesus' day probably felt they were doing pretty well in the era of adultery. Uh, most people today, you'd say, uh, would feel they're doing pretty well there. Jesus says that commandment's good. It's pointing to the hard issue of lust. Have you lusted before? Has your eye lusted? Uh, that can lead you to hell. In fact, the words of Jesus are, uh, tear out your eye or cut off your hand uh, if it's causing you to lust. It's better to go into heaven with two hands or two eyes than to go into hell with one eye or one hand. They are the words of Jesus in that sermon. It's pretty brutal, isn't it? Uh, he finishes off the chapter, kind of summarising it all together. He says, you must therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I mean, that is devastating. That is a horrible sermon. 
Uh, I was thinking about during the week, usually when this sermon is done in pictures, I had a look on Google. Um, Jesus is sitting on a rock. Uh, there's butterflies. Everyone's looking up at him, smiling. Uh, green grass, blue skies. And uh, I thought, I don't think that's very accurate. I think at this point when he says, you must be perfect, everyone was probably crying. Um, it's horrible. It's devastating. It really is. It's worth stopping to ask, you know, why does Jesus care so much about the sins of the heart? Why are they so grievous to him? Why does he care so much about what happens there? Um, there was a song that came out in 2020 called uh, I Still Talk to Jesus. Uh, you might know the song, um, and I'd make no apologies if that's stuck in your head now. Um, I think it speaks into the situation of sin really well. Um, so I'm going to read some of the lyrics out to you and then I kind of unpack them afterwards. Uh, here we go. It says this, If there's a heaven, I hope that I get in. But I probably won't. I break all the rules, I do all the things the Bible says don't. I don't change my ways, I don't change my shirt. I go from the club straight to the church. It's the same prayer, it's the same hurt. Maybe I drink too much, uh, fall in and out of love. There's been a couple times I've done a couple lines. I lie to my mama, I smoke marijuana. Most of the time, I do what I want to. You might not believe it, but I still talk to Jesus. You know, I think this song is a good summary uh, of the pain and the attraction of sin in that it is unfulfilling, but it's addictive and it has a power over us. I really feel for this person, the person who wrote this song and anyone who resonates with these lyrics because uh, what it is, it's a cry for connection. I still talk to Jesus. Uh, but they feel trapped in a life of competing loves uh, that's push, pushing them away from God. You know, this might take a little bit of understanding. I'm going to say it anyway. Um, sin is not so much about doing the act. Uh, marijuana, lions, gone to the club. Uh, sin is more about what the act is doing to us. It's not so much about what you do. It's more about what it's doing to you. Um, at the start, he says, if there's a heaven, I hope that I get in. Um, following Jesus is not so much about being let into heaven as much as it is letting heaven into us. Um, sin stiff arms that reality, says no to God. I won't let you come in and tell me what I should do with my heart. Sin at the core rejects God's ownership. That is it at the very core. And Jesus puts his finger on the human heart and says that's where the power is, that's where the force is to lead us away. From God. Jesus comes in his magnificent grace and gives us a severe warning on what sin does to us. That's part A. Part B is he comes with a surprising welcome. How does Jesus treat sinners in light of everything he said about sin? How does he treat them? And you and I know the answer. He loves sinners. Jesus loves sinners. Best news in the world. Uh, you will know that, but I want to make it a little bit personal. Now, again, you're going to be pretty safe sitting in your seat. It's not going to ask you to respond. Um, we're going to do like an imagination exercise a little bit. Uh, imagine yourself after this service, you're going to go and uh, have lunch with Jesus. You're going to sit down with him. How do you think Jesus would uh, feel about you? What do you think he'd be thinking about you? And what would he say to you? Now, you all know the correct answers to this. Jesus loves me. Uh, but what do you carry around in the core of your gut? I did this exercise during the week just to be really uh, upfront, And I did feel that uh, Jesus would love me. Uh, but I felt that if I sat down with him, there would be an undertone of disappointment. That I'm not exactly who maybe he'd hoped I would be. That's just being honest. Um, I think it's a good exercise to do if you want to spend the time in that. Um, I want to help you in this because we're not going to set aside that time to do it now. But to paint a picture, uh, present a mould of a person and I want you to see if you fit that mould. Okay, I've got three different people. Uh, person number one. So you're someone that's followed Jesus for years. You're a Christian. Uh, but you still often choose to do what you shouldn't. In moments of high pressure or of weakness, you buckle time and time again. Maybe you've failed multiple times in the same area. What would Jesus say to you? 
How do you think Jesus would feel about you? What would he think about you? What's in your gut? You know, that mould fits that of uh, Peter, a follower of Jesus, significant one of that. Uh, And at history's biggest moment, like when Jesus was being delivered over to death, uh, Peter denied knowing him, not once, not twice, three times. And how did Jesus respond to Peter? When Jesus came back, resurrected body, he met, he greeted Peter from afar and cooked him breakfast. If you this week or last night gave in to temptation once again, I have a word for you. Jesus wants to have breakfast with you. There is a surprising welcome for you in Jesus. Very surprising. Uh, Person number two, maybe you don't identify with that one as much. You're someone who's made some mistakes, uh, big mistakes, or big mistakes have been made to you. Uh, And you feel the shame of that, Um, either way. Uh, Maybe you feel the rejection of others or the judgment of others or the accusations of other people. And if you're honest with yourself, you're a broken person. Do you fit that mould? What do you think Jesus would say to you? What would he feel about you? What would he be thinking about you? You That mould fits the person... A woman who was caught in adultery during Jesus' time. She was found out by the religious elite uh, and they threw her down before Jesus and publicly shamed her. Uh, in terms of like shame, it's hard to put, a, to put words to how much shame she would have felt. Uh, they threw her down before Jesus and said, the law of Moses says that she should be stoned and die for what she's done. Jesus, what do you say? How did Jesus respond to her? Jesus literally stood up for her. It says he was writing something in the ground. He stood up. He turned to the accusers and said, he who hasn't sinned, throw the first stone. They all went away. The one person who could have thrown a stone was Jesus. And Jesus' response to her was, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Are you someone who feels the shame of your mistakes or mistakes done to you? There is a surprising welcome for you in Jesus. Very surprising. The same Jesus who says, Adultery, it's not just about that, it's about lust. He sees someone, finds someone in adultery and says, neither do I condemn you. That's surprising. Uh, Person number three, and it's beautiful. Um, Maybe you're this person. You're not a follower of Jesus. Uh, You know that, and God knows that. Uh, And you've been living completely different to the way that a Christian would. Uh, You've got a reputation. Uh, Maybe you've got some history. Uh, But you do find Jesus interesting. And that would be the reason you're here this morning uh, or you're listening online. If you sat down with Jesus, what do you think Jesus would say to you? Uh, There's a man named Zacchaeus. Talk about someone who had a reputation and history. Uh, He made a living cheating money off people, cheating people. And he was hated by the people. I think if we're honest, uh, there's a special place in the Australian's heart that hates that sort of person. Uh, Someone who makes a living cheating people. He was hated. People didn't like him. Um, How does Jesus respond to him, though? Uh, Zacchaeus comes to hear Jesus uh, speaking, and Jesus looks up at him and says, You dirty sinner, get out of the tree. No, he doesn't. He says, Zacchaeus, I must have dinner with you. That would have been shocking to everyone. If you're someone who fits that mould, I want you to hear this that Jesus thinks you're valuable of his time. Jesus wants to spend time with you. The question for you is, will you give him that time? You know, Peter and that woman who's caught in adultery in Zacchaeus, I think if they could uh, summarise their experience of Jesus, they would all say one word, grace. Grace. You know, it all came to a head on the cross. Um, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. And in doing so, brings us all, all people, uh, the gift of salvation. It's wonderful news. You know, Jesus pulls no punches on the power of sin. He lets us know. Uh, But his life was one of stunning grace. Stunning grace. You don't need to do anything to get that. No works will credit us to God in that sense. We just need to receive it. God's grace has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And thirdly, third point, 
uh, God's grace trains us. It says, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. You know, this word training actually comes up earlier in the chapter. Uh, It's last week's sermon uh, when it talks about the older women training the younger women. I want to have a quick look at it. Uh, From the end of verse 3, Uh, Speaking of the older women, it says, They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. Now, what is that a picture of? It's a beautiful picture. Uh, It's a picture of the older women coming alongside the younger women. It's a picture of the older women uh, sharing their experience of dealing with stubborn husbands. Uh, It's a picture of the older women walking together with the younger women. And in the same way, using the same word of training, we're told here God's grace trains us. Now that's a picture of God coming alongside, sharing his experience and walking with us. Now that's beautiful. That is awesome. But how does that work practically? How does that actually work? And this is where rubber really hits the road uh, for us as Christians. How does God's grace train us or change us? Uh, The first way, God trains us, uh, is that he reminds us and he makes us his own. He makes us his own. Uh, Verse 14 has just a beautiful summary about the purpose and goal of God for us. Uh, It says that his goal for us is to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. The first way he trains us is that he reminds us that we are his own. Uh, Last week, Don said that Australians don't like the word submission. Um, I think that's fair. I want to contest it's the same with the idea of being someone else's possession. Uh, I don't think we like that. We like the thought of that. That's a scary thought. Not being our own, being someone else's. But if we consider the God of whom we speak of, uh, who has grace and loves the desperately unworthy, um, I'll contest it's not a scary thing at all. In fact, it's a very freeing thing. Um, God, through his spirit, working through our faith in Jesus, comes and lives with us. There is awesome freedom in that. You know, before Jesus, going back to the Old Testament, uh, the old times, they needed temples, they needed rituals, lots of weird ceremonial practices. If you've read the Old Testament before, sometimes you're shaking your head going, what's going on here? Uh, All of that just to meet with God. And now because of Jesus, what he's come and done, The Holy Spirit can come and live with us and be here. We don't need to do all those little things anymore. Uh, Awesome freedom in that he meets us. So the first way God trains us is that he reminds us and makes us his own. The second way God trains us uh, is that he gives us a desire to live for God. We hear in verse 14, his goal for us to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. You know, this is kind of a, a picture of purified motives. Uh, that we're changed. We want to do what's good. Not out of a need that we have to make up our salvation, but because of it, with God's grace is the foundation. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this is often abused in churches, um, what the Holy Spirit does. Uh, someone once approached me. This wasn't at a church. Um, they had brochures in their hands, and they came up to me and they asked, are you a Christian? Um, They weren't perceptive, that was kind of their opening line, and I said, uh, yes, I am. And uh, then they asked, do you have the Holy Spirit? And I said something smart, like, you better believe it. Uh, In the back of my head, I think my eyes rolled, and I went, here we go, here we go. Uh, They looked a bit puzzled when I said yes, and then they asked, have you spoken in tongues? I said, no. And they went on to then claim that therefore... They have the insight of God and they have like a peculiar wisdom uh, that I don't have. Now, I'm very thankful for my upbringing um, at Odinka Bay Baptist Church and for my parents um, in that I know what the Holy Spirit does. And it's a real privilege for me to be able to share that with you. The insight of God is something that you all have, that we all have. Insight, the inner side of faith That is something that the Holy Spirit comes and gives us, all of us. You know, I'm in a daily battle, we're in a daily battle of working out, am I going to live for God or am I going to live for myself? 
And the beauty of the Holy Spirit is he comes and meets us in that battle, but not against us, not as an enemy. He comes and meets us. He's for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, when I, whenever I've had the courage to ask uh, God, you know, where am I living for myself and not for you, God? Uh, the Holy Spirit, I think, rubs his hands together and says, uh, here, 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 here and here. And then he says, and you are owned and you are loved by God, Jonathan. God's grace trains us in two ways. He makes us and he reminds us that we are owned by him. And that's a beautiful thing. And the second way uh, is that he, he fights for us. He's with us. He's giving us a desire to actually live for him. That's a beautiful thing. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls this freedom from the dark dungeon of one's ego. Uh, that's beautiful. The Holy Spirit's working on us, training us in what is good. And it's not a matter of win or loss. There's one verse that I haven't even touched on this whole time. It's perhaps the best one in the whole thing. Uh, verse 13, it says that we are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You know, that's not an if and or but will that happen. Uh, everyone who trains has a goal. And that's our goal. We're working to the glory of God. God's grace has appeared. God's grace uh, saves us and it trains us on the goal to God's glory. Let me just pray as we finish. Father, we just, uh, we just thank you so much that you have loved us, you love us, and you showed us Jesus so that we could really know you. You say if we've known Jesus, we have seen you. And we thank you for that reality. Lord, make that reality sit really, uh, really strong, really obvious, really clear in our hearts and our heads um, so that we can worship you with our lives. Um, yeah, and we thank you for this word this morning. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.